Well, good evening, everybody. Um, as I said, I'm Tim Widener. I'm the director of the Chapman Museum. And um, our topic this evening is Seneca Ray Stoddard's best work. I first started thinking about this a few months ago as I was um, sort of working on other things. And I noticed that there was a particular group of photographs of Stoddard's that had caught my attention. Um, and so I started looking at that more and realized that, oh, there's a program right here if I just look at this particular group. Uh, originally, I had entitled the talk, uh, Seneca Ray Stoddard's Best Work, and I called it his full plate photographs. Well, that was a little premature. I'll explain that later when we get into the talk. Um, this process is always one of discovery. And in this case here, as I was working on the program, I learned a great uh, deal of things. So I'll share them with you as well. First of all, who was Seneca Ray Stoddard for those of you that might not be familiar with him? Um, Seneca Ray Stoddard was born in 1843, uh, at least for the purpose of this story, we'll use that year. It's somewhat debated, but I'll use 1843 in Wilton. Um, as a young man, he uh, got a job painting rail cars in Troy. However, in the early 1860s, he relocated to Glens Falls, New York, where at first he uh, advertised himself as a sign painter and an artist, but he took up photography. And uh, that became his um, primary occupation for quite a few years. Um, and what he did was quite different from many other photographers of his time period. And uh, what we'll do is um, give you an idea of that. Uh, here is a picture of him on the right in a uh, chasm um, around 1873. He was known to have gone through that area at the time. Uh, and here he is pictured with this photographic um, get up his apparatus, at least the camera part of it at that point. Uh, when he started, photography was a fairly involved process where uh, the photographer had to actually coat his negatives in the field, uh, shoot his pictures, process them there, right there in the field. And uh, it was an arduous process. Stoddard actually usually worked with an assistant who would do the processing in a portable dark room that they took right to the location where he was photographing. Uh, he also often would hire a local boy to be running the glass plates back and forth from the camera where he worked to the portable dark room where his assistant uh, processed the negatives. Uh, in, his, in the beginning, he photographed locally. Uh, pictures of the falls uh, in Glens Falls, as you can see in the left here. He also traveled up to Lake George and um, where he would take photographs around the lake. And, um, and then, but fairly early in the 1870s, he started making trips into the Adirondacks. And where he differed from many other professional photographers of the time period is that he photographed landscapes. Um, there are others that did that somewhat, but their bread and butter was portraits that they would do in their studio. Whereas Stoddard photo photographed places which he would then make into prints that he sold to the people that were coming to the area to spend their summers here, or at least part of the summer. I took pictures of the hotels, uh, of the sites that people traveled to see. And uh, he produced them uh, in little carte de visites, like you see on the left in stereo cards, similar to the one on your right. And also, of course, locked up. In these, um, cards that were a little over four by seven inches wide. Uh, they came on a standard mat uh, that was commercially produced. Uh, here you see the Fort William Henry on the left, and then a view of up, Upper Osebo Pond on the right. These deer years are approximate. Um, we don't, these photographs were not uh, dated specifically. He always identified the place. Um, but uh, rarely provided us with an exact date when he took a picture. Um, as we go through these photographs today, 
Um, I will stop to mention the history of some of the buildings that we see. I know some people are interested in that. Uh, in other cases where they're strictly landscapes, there really isn't much to say, and I hope we can just enjoy the view. Um, the first one that we've encountered here is the Fort William Henry Hotel, which was uh, remodeled in 1868 by T.E. Russell and Sons uh, in the French Empire style. It greatly expanded um, the size of the hotel and the number of guests they could accommodate. It had this two-story porch that you can see on the front of it that um, was quite impressive and it really uh, dominated this bluff at the south end of the lake. Uh, it burned in 1909 and uh, the hotel that followed it certainly didn't have the same um, impressive stature as the one that we see here. So what was I interested in? Um, there were quite a few photographs that had a different size than the four and a quarter by seven and a half ones that Stoddard had primarily printed along with stereo views in the 1870s and early 1880s. Um, these photographs are all approximately six and a half by eight and a half. And uh, they all start uh, in the late 1880s, around 1888 and run into the 1890s. And for the purposes of our talk tonight, I'm just sticking to 1888 to 1893. But you'll see they have a different format. They have a different ratio of height to width. And that gave Stoddard a great deal of more flexibility to compose his photographs. And uh, as we go through them today, I hope uh, you will notice that uh, where there's things that are particularly uh, noteworthy, I'll bring them to your attention. But uh, that is the primary thing that interested me were these six and a half by eight and a half photographs. They're a little bit larger, just a little. Um, and uh, they just give him much more space to work in. We saw the Fort William Henry uh, in that mid 1870s photograph. Here's another one that was taken in 1891. Uh, another thing that I noticed in this photography from uh, the late 1880s and 90s is that although sometimes he was taking um, a photograph that we might consider to be sort of documentary, it's sort of capturing the place and time. In these later photographs, um, he's often also interested in sort of capturing an idyllic Adirondack scene. It was something that um, people would be able to connect with, not necessarily because of the place, although they might be interested in that, but it was more something that just sort of captured their experience while they were here. Um, so that's something, there's a subtle change in what he's doing. In some photographs, it's much more noticeable. Uh, the Lakeview House on the right here uh, in Bolton uh, was built in the late 1800s to catered to a growing class of vacationers, many of whom came from New York City. Uh, so they were looking for rather nice amenities as opposed to just a, a wilderness experience. Um, it accommodated 125 guests. It had a music hall, tennis grounds, large fleet of boats, some of which you see here, a dark room for, top, for photography. And that's an important element of this story. Uh, bathhouses, Pure spring water, good to know. Telegraph office, four daily mails, billiards and bowling. Um, it was truly uh, a pretty nice place there in Bolton. And again, like many others, it burned eventually in the 1930s. I mentioned the dark room. One of the things that happened started in the 1880s is that photography became much more doable for want of a better term for everyday people. In this case here, the everyday people are middle class and upper class individuals that are coming to Lake George to vacation. They had leisure time, they had money to buy the equipment and the supplies. And so you have people that are coming to the Adirondacks with their own cameras. So they're no longer dependent upon buying memento photos from Seneca Ray Stoddard. Um, so Stoddard, in order to remain uh, viable in this business, had to start going in new directions with his photography. 
he had to be doing something that was a little better than what the average person could do with their own camera gear. And I inserted this one here. It's a little out of sequence with many of the others uh, that I've included because I think it really makes the point of here we have a photograph that Stoddard took in 1890. It's not of any specific place. It's uh, almost abstract in its approach. And one of the things that I find repeatedly in many of these photographs is if you look at the positioning of the horizon, he's actually using much more of the negative to be focusing on subject matter that's in the foreground. We'll see this repeated many times as we go through the photographs, even though the actual subject matter might be quite different, he still is using this approach. The other thing that's quite true is that by the late 1880s, Stoddard was using commercially made glass plate negatives. He was not coding his own anymore. He was buying them from Rochester, or one of the other glass plate manufacturers. Uh, and number one, um, it was a much easier process, but also the um, emulsion on these glass plate negatives was improved greatly in a fairly short period of time. So by this time, it's much more sensitive and allowed him a much greater range of density in his photographs. He could actually photograph uh, foreground and sky in the same photograph often. Um, he was not uh, required to take really long exposures. It just gave him much more flexibility and actually it was a better product. Uh, so he could produce better photographs by this time. One of the first places that he visited on his first trip to the Adirondacks was Osable Chasm. Um, he re revisited it more than once. Uh, here's a couple of photographs that were both taken at the same on the same day, same time in 1889. I can say that because I found the same twig in the same place in the rocks. Um, but you can see here how he's using the entire canvas, you might say, of the negative to compose this particular image. And uh, just two different compositions that he's created just by repositioning the camera a few feet. Uh, both are very successful in my opinion, uh, and they both are really work well to um, sort of draw the viewer into the scene and to look around and, and look at the details uh, here and there in the picture. And I've included other, a couple other photographs for you um, from that trip. On the left is uh, looking up from the long gallery, gateway on the right, a couple more. And here, these I, I found really interesting just because of the composition that he's able to achieve from his vantage point. On the left, he is looking down into the chasm and, and the subject matter is in the lower half of the, of the photograph. And on the one on the right, you'll see that the boat is in the upper right hand corner of the photograph. And what he's photographed in the foreground is just the rapids, the water passing over the rocks. Um, it really gives a sense of motion to the photograph, even though um, things are frozen in that particular moment. Here's a photograph heading out into the central Adirondacks. And I'll apologize now for jumping all over the place in these photographs. Um, I never did quite get them in perfect order, but we'll get through them. Uh, this is Prospect House on Blue Mountain Lake. Um, it was finished in 1882. Many of these places were finished right about the same time as he's doing this photography. And it's when a time when many people could get to the area by railroad and steamboat. So you had these grand hotels being built throughout the Adirondacks in the late 1880s, right up to 1890 and past that. Um, this was a four and a half story hotel. And what was really distinctive about it, it was the first hotel that had electric lights in every room. Um, 
In fact, uh, so I understand, the wiring was even installed by Thomas Edison himself. It included a bowling alley, a billiard room, library, physician's office, pharmacy, and a restaurant. Uh, the financial panic of 1893 gave it a big blow. Uh, they also had uh, some cases of typhoid, which of course scared people away to a certain extent, and it closed in 1903. Uh, and it was actually torn down in 1915. So uh, fairly short lived life as this grand hotel on Blue Mountain Lake. Further west, uh, we come to Hathorne's Golden Beach on Racket Lake. Um, he was one of the early people to actually move into the central Adirondacks and go into business there. Um, he ran, uh, cottages on the west side of Racket Lake. It's now part of the state park now uh, until his death by drowning in 1891. Uh, his guests would come to the nearby um, steamboat landing and then he would bring them by rowboat down to Golden Beach and uh, he provided guides for his guests, hired a cook to prepare meals for them and of course cooked up any fish or game that they caught. Uh, a different location on the right side is the Sagamore, one of the other Sagamores, this one on Long Lake. Um, and here I'll point out that he's, like he did in many of his early photographs, here he has framed the photo using these two trees. Uh, and the hotel that you see in the distance um, opened in 1885 burned down four years later, 1889, is rebuilt uh, two, years later, two years later, and at that time boasted 200 rooms. Here we have a couple of uh, boating scenes, uh, one on Racket Lake, as you see on the left, and then um, the canal that was dug into Simon's Pond uh, photo dating from 1888. I just can't imagine the work that went into digging that ditch. There's some other wonderful photographs uh, in this area, uh, two very different ones. Uh, here on the left is Long Lake from the outlet. And again, he's focused on these tall um, grasses in the foreground. Um, and on the right, he is filling the, the frame of the negative with this waterfall. At the time that uh, Stoddard was um, doing this photography, he also was extremely interested in what was happening to the Adirondacks. And he documented some of the things that he encountered and used though, them in uh, to illustrate articles that he was writing about how the Adirondacks were being damaged by uh, the timber interest, interests primarily, particularly the large paper companies that would back up streams and create these lakes which would choke out the trees and in the spring they would release the water and, and it would take all their logs down to the mills. Um, and it was also part of the imagery that he used when he spoke to the New York State Legislature in advocating for creation of the Adirondack Park, which would be controlled. Um, and these two photographs here show uh, to a certain extent what happened because of that, um, the damming activity. Here we've, uh, we've come back to the Keene Valley to the Keene area where uh, we see some very different photographs. These uh, rather than focusing on um, the lakes are looking more at the mountains. Um, and uh, one thing I couldn't find is anything about Windy Brow other than where it was. Um, didn't know whether it was the name of a specific place where people could stay or whether it was just a location that was locally known. Um, he took quite a few photographs 
in the, um, the Keene Valley, in particular, um, as we'll see in what became in the Osable Lakes area, or what we know of as, um, sorry, my mind goes blank there for a second, uh, St. Hubert's. It's now part of the, um, the reserve. Um, and Flume Cottage was one of the smaller buildings that was there. There were many cottages that um, wealthy people from the city built in the area, but there were also um, some other areas that were more uh, shared, you might say. Here's a couple photographs looking um, towards Osable Pass. Um, from the area where St. Hubert's Inn is located. Uh, you'll see they're a couple years apart and you can actually see the development that occurred in the road there. Um, the area had first been developed um, and the hotel was called Beatty's or Beads Hotel. It was operated um, by the Bead family. It was uh, very popular. It was part of a really large lumber tract which had been owned by uh, a Plattsburgh lumberman. When word uh, got out that he was interested in selling it, uh, a group of investors purchased it and created what is still a, a large preserve. Uh, many of them had their own cottages on the lake, I mean, on, in, here in the valley. Um, and what was really nice about it, it had this um, access to the lakes, which are to the west there the Osable Lakes. Um, the Beatty Hotel burned, um, but the investors immediately rebuilt it and named the, the new structure St. Hubert's Inn for the patron saint of hunted deer. Here uh, we see the, the new gateway to the Adirondack Mountain Reserve in 1891. Heading west into the lakes, uh, here's a, a really lovely photograph uh, that Stoddard took uh, looking uh, at Lower Osable Lake. And if we go um, further to the west, uh, here's a photograph of the Great Peaks from the south uh, taken in 1888. In this area, uh, one way to get into um, the peaks is to follow the waterways. Uh, lake Sanford is a long lake that uh, works its way into the mountains. And many of these are just um, really wonderful photographs that he took at that time. A little further to the east is a picture from a hill. I don't know which one it is looking at um, the Valley of the Boreas. In this case here, I'm sure that he is burnt in a sky. It's rather noticeable. Um, he often did that. He did that earlier, um, starting very early with his uh, smaller photographs. He would combine images a sky image from one negative with uh, a landscape uh, from another uh, to create a dramatic effect. Here are a couple of winter scenes. Uh, the one on the left, Calamity Pond. Uh, the monument was erected in memory of David Henderson, who was uh, operated the Adirondack Iron and Steel Company. He was killed in an accident when his firearm accidentally discharged and hit him. Uh, and his family erected this monument uh, later in his memory. One of Stoddard's uh, really well-known photographs on the right of Lake Tier of the Clouds. Moving right into the High Peaks area, um, he took several images in the Avalanche Lake area from each end, actually. Um, 
And you can see here how the, the longer length of the, um, not the length, the, the height of the photograph just allowed him to capture more of the dramatic um, difference in elevation that one finds in this area, going all the way from water level up, steep cliffs on either side. Now we're gonna move north of the high peaks, uh, starting in Saranac Lake, the Saranac Lake House, um, often known as Martin's, was uh, originally built in 1849. This uh, one on the left you'll see is a, a later um, remodeled and expanded version of it, which was located on the southeast shore of Lower Saranac Lake. On the right, uh, we see the Ho Hotel Ampersand, which opened in 1888. Um, so Stoddard was right there as this one was being created. Um, it had a view of Ampersand Mountain and actually sat across the bay from Saranac Lake House. One of the highlights of this place was that it had um, windows that entirely surrounded it which offered uh, wonderful views. It was built to actually be a place that was used in the winter. Uh, it had more modern construction. And so those windows allowed people to experience the outdoors without necessarily experiencing the cold. It was expanded in 1891 to include a larger dining room, separate rooms for ladies and men's, and children's activities, a barbershop, reading room, post office, general store, and more than 50 of the rooms had their own fireplaces. Um, they had their own farm, which provided fresh fruits, vegetables, and dairy products. And uh, let's see, what else can I say? Oh, it burned in 1907. So it was only there for a few years and it was not rebuilt. Another view of it from the other side on the left here. Wabeek House or Hotel um, was built in 1889 and uh, had 200 guest rooms and cottages. And it was uh, opened on the southwest shore of Upper Saranac Lake. Um, at the historic Sweeney Carry, which was a place where people portaged, portaged um, to the Racket River. And the guests could choose between luxurious, luxurious rooms or cottages or even carpeted platform tents along the shore. And despite um, its location and all the amenities that it offered, it nevertheless closed in 1913. Here's a, one of my favorite views, just because it's so different, uh, that Stoddard took looking at uh, Saranac Lake in winter. You'll notice how actually one of the dominant features is those uh, saplings that you see in the foreground. Heading uh, east to the Lake Placid area, um, here there's a lot of dramatic views because um, a lot of the hillsides had been cleared. So you could actually take photographs from one great hotel across the lake at another one. Uh, it was a great way of including a lot of detail, a lot of scale. Um, and there's a few here I'll mention. Uh, the Stevens House, which you see on the far hill on the low and on the left. Um, Let's see, uh, it originally had been called the Excelsior House. It was uh, remodeled and it stood at 2000 feet above sea level. So when it opened in 1877, it was the highest hotel in the Adirondacks. Um, it burned in 1885, uh, just seven years after it was opened. Uh, however, it was immediately rebuilt and opened very quickly um, and it actually lasted until the 1940s. So one of the longer lasting hotels in the Adirondacks. 
Uh, Moses Ferguson, who at one time operated Stevens House, uh, left there and built his own hotel, the Grandview House in 1878, um, on an even higher hill. Um, well, I need to go to the next image, sorry. There's the Grandview House, give you an idea of how it sort of dominated the skyline. Um, had three stories, had an observation lookout, uh, veranda that wrapped around it, as you see there, and uh, it was well stocked with rocking chairs. And uh, the Grandview occupied the site of the Lake Placid Resort uh, Holiday Inn today. Mirror Lake House, which you see on the uh, far shore, was built in 1882. Um, it was purchased in 1888 when it was uh, improved. Uh, they installed an electric plant at that time. And um, one writer commented that the Mirror Lake was a magnificent, imposing palace of a place the likes of which had never before been seen in the North Country. In 1894, it burned. I jumped ahead of myself here, but I do want to talk about um, the Ruiz Amont. I'm really poor at French, so. Um, Pardon my pronunciation there. This was one of the later um, built hotels. Um, it was actually finished in 1893. Um, and actually there's a photograph you see on the left there as it's still under construction where Stoddard is taking a picture of it almost from the shoreline looking up at it. He went back a few years later and took a picture of it as completed as you see on the right. Um, it was um, owned and operated by the Lake Placid Improvement Company, a group of New York City investors, and it burned in 1909. This is uh, entitled Wolf Pond Chattagay Railroad. There are numerous wolf ponds in the Adirondacks, but I could not find one that's located near the route of the Chattagay Railroad. So it must be some pond that was either so small it doesn't have a name now, or it was named something else in time. Uh, the Chattagay Railroad was created uh, by the Chattagay Iron Company in 1879 to transport uh, ore from Lion Mountain to Dannemora, and from there out to uh, Lake Champlain. And um, it was extended in the 1880s, eventually making it to Saranac Lake in 1887. In time, it was taken over by the DNH um, and continued to function as a railroad uh, providing passenger service. I mentioned at the start that I'm always learning something. Um, when I'm doing research. And this photograph here is um, where I'll let you in on what I learned. I had started out saying that, oh, we're gonna do a talk about Stoddard's um, full plate photographs because they were six and a half by eight and a half in dimension, which is the dimension of a full plate negative um, going way back in history of photography. What I discovered is I said it finally at some point, well, I'm going to go find some of those negatives. We must have some of them in our collection. The photograph on the left of Child Wild Park House is a six and a half by an eight and a half print. The negative that you see on the right is an eight by 10 negative. Stoddard didn't use six and a half and eight by eight and a half negatives. He used eight by 10 negatives, and then he would crop them to make these smaller prints. You can see a crop line going across the bottom of it there. What's also interesting about that, sort of, uh, you know, a quarter of the way up on the negative, there is a, a line of text. In the print on the left, the text is much lower in the image. So Stoddard actually redid this one and 
put his caption higher in the negative so that he could actually make it into one of those four and a quarter by seven and a half prints that he had made for years and obviously continued to do. Um, what I discovered in looking at uh, the negative collection that we had, I found a number of the negatives for prints that I was including in the show. Um, almost all of them were eight by 10 glass negatives. And in order to um, crop them, he would actually glue strips of paper that he had cut from his mostly Lake George or Adirondack maps. He would have cut them up into strips and paste them around the edge of the negative to create the six and a half by eight and a half size print, glued them right on. But I also found something that really amazed me because you always read about how flexible film was essentially um, produced on a commercial basis by Eastman Kodak. And um, it was available very late in this process as far as Stoddard was concerned. And initially when they first made it available, you had to buy the film with a camera and the film was really small. Well, I found images from the 1890s, early 1890s, I believe, that were actually eight by 10 sheets of cellulose nitrate negative, which I just had no idea that it was actually available at that time period. But somehow Stoddard got his hands on it because we have negatives of prints that he made and the prints. Um, that's still a mystery to me a little bit. I'd love to dig into that a little deeper, but uh, what I can confidently talk about today are the glass plate negatives. So Childwold House. Um, this was one of the late arrivals in the Adirondacks. It was uh, located on Massawippi Lake uh, in the Northern Adirondacks, uh, St. Lawrence County. Um, the main hotel that you see there was built in 1889 and open for business the following year. Um, it had lots of amenities. It had cottages to the side, uh, fresh vegetables, dairy products that were um, grown on the estate, wild game. You could go there and hunt, um, and, but supplies were brought in by railroad um, because of its location. You could hire guides. Uh, there was a livery, they had their own physician telegraph and mail service and their own post office. Uh, the railroad went within six miles of the hotel, so you'd be met there and, and probably carried in a, a Jubert and White carriage to actually get to the hotel. Like many other places, it had a bowling alley, a billiard room, casino, uh, sun parlor, which we'll see in a few minutes, library, tennis courts, polished maple floor for dancing, stage, ball field, basketball courts, golf grounds, and a 40 by 60 Adirondack room complete with open stone fireplaces. It closed in 1909. It really wasn't a success financially. Uh, it continued to be used uh, by private individuals for another few decades, finally being demolished in 1946. There's some really interesting photos that Stoddard took um, at this location. And I've included a couple of them here because he's sort of taking a photograph from a shadowed foreground and you see the building in full sunlight on the far side. So he's looking through these trees and his subject is sort of hidden and in the distance. Um, he did the same thing in the picture on the right of the Hotel Champlain um, which we'll see more pictures of, but he's shooting from the shadow uh, into the daylit area. On the left, we have a photograph very similar that he did at Adirondack Lodge. Um, and of course, on the right, there's a picture which he identifies as being Clear Lake from Adirondack Lodge and a little bit of history of Adirondack Lodge. It was built in 1880. It's not the same building that's there now, of course. Uh, it was much larger. Um, and it also was at the base of uh, Mount Joe, 
which Van Hovenberg, the developer named anonymous wife, had 70 foot tall observation tower. That's where Stoddard took his photograph on the right from the observation tower looking at the lake. 60 rooms, three floors, and guests could stay for $4 per day or $16 per week, food and lodging included. In addition to the lodge, Van, Ho Van Hovenberg um, actually constructed many trails in the area. And um, he eventually sold it to the Lake Placid Company, the owner of the Lake Placid Club. And um, Dr. Dewey, who was the founder of the club, was a real advocate of phonetic spelling. So he actually changed the name from Adirondack Lodge spelled with a DGE to LOJ, which we're familiar with now. It burned in 1903 uh, and was rebuilt with the structure that I believe still is there. I've included a couple of photographs here of the Cascade Lakes, just sort of to move us away uh, to other locations. Uh, here they're looking at the two different lakes. Uh, the Cascade House, which you see in the distance on the one on the right, um, was located actually on a landslide um, from Cascade Mountain. Um, it was a 100 guest structure, which actually boasted its own post, post office, which actually was seasonal. Uh, it was called Cascadeville PO. Um, the unfortunate thing is that when they were putting through the state route, um, blasting actually damaged the building and uh, it had to be torn down. This is a, a couple of photographs that uh, I just encountered uh, not too long ago. Uh, they're in the Elizabethtown area. It's not anything I'd done research on before, so I didn't stumble upon them. Uh, but I thought they are um, really nice, nice landscapes that sort of captured uh, a different type of area compared to the high peaks or the Great Lakes uh, that we see in some of the other photographs. I'm gonna include a few snow photographs that he took. Uh, the one, the Cedars of Lake Colton is one of his well-known ones on the right. I've included this one, uh, just it's another example of where I found uh, the glass plate negative that goes with the print that we have. We looked at uh, the one photograph of the Hotel Champlain uh, a couple of moments ago. Uh, this is a rather astounding photograph that he took actually from um, the balcony that's very high on the building. Um, here he's looking off um, to the north. The Hotel Champlain was erected in 1890. So he's there just as the place is opening. Uh, it took a year and a half to complete. It was such a grand structure. It uh, had a capacity of 400. Uh, it had a bar room, children's playroom, servants quarters, three elevators, billiard hall, cafe, ballroom, wine rooms, um, seven cottages on the grounds. Here are some of the ones um, that I've included. And one of the things that I found really fascinating about this photograph, because I saw it in parallels in some other photographs, is how Stoddard is actually working with the patterns of those roads and footpaths. That's almost the subject of this photograph. Like I showed in that real early photograph of the, the reeds in the water, uh, the foreground is actually the subject matter of this photograph with the one carriage right at the junction He's photographing the patterns. That's what he's interested in here. Here's another one that I think is, is doing the same thing. Uh, this is located at St. Hubert's. And again, he's interested in the composition of what he's finding in the foreground with the pattern of the roads as they come and go. And here, 
we're going a long ways away, but it's one of my favorite photographs. Uh, he took this in New York City. It's a photograph of the battery uh, in uh, the southern part of Manhattan. Um, and he's using a high vantage point to, to capture the patterns of the pathways and roads and the train track, um, all sort of backlit by the, the sun. Talked a little bit about how he, he was experimenting with how he was cropping his photographs. Here is one that he took from the torch looking down at the head of the Statue of Liberty. And in the actual photograph that you see in the light, in, on, in the left, I'm sorry, and this is remarkable, this is actually a full print, you can see his crop line for how he intended to crop the photograph on other occasions. And so I actually so I spun it around a little bit and recropped it to use uh, the line that he had indicated. So you can see how the composition changes from one image to the other. Another thing that Stoddard uh, became quite adept at is using flash photography, which was actually a magnesium powder that would be ignited. Uh, he took a series of these campfire scenes. Um, this one was taken at the American Canoe Association meet on Long Island in 1890. And he has used flash to actually illuminate um, much more of the area than would actually be illuminated by just the fire, by the bonfire. One of the other things that he did is that I mentioned how he had to be doing photography that wasn't readily available to just the amateur photographer that was bringing in his own camera or her own camera to the Adirondacks. He took these photographs that sort of captured uh, iconic Adirondack scenes. In other words, people would look at it and say, oh yeah, that's the Adirondacks, there's hunters or there's a group of campers on the right-hand side, um, actually a group doing the Adirondack survey in 1888. He also started using sort of catchy little titles for his prints. Game in the Adirondacks is a group of four guys playing cards on the left. And uh, the quasi portrait that you see on the right, he doesn't identify who the individual is. That's not really important. He entitles it Absorbed. Uh, one of the other um, outstanding examples of his flash photography, he took a photograph of the Washington Square Arch in New York City. Uh, he also did the Statue of Liberty. I didn't include it here because it's a different format. It's long and narrow and tall. Uh, but there's an interesting story here in this particular occasion because uh, he actually got hurt when the flash got a little out of control. But overall, he was one of the first people to really master flash photography, particularly in an outdoor setting where you were having to illuminate a really large area. Um, actually, this is the beginning of a series that I'm going to be talking about interior photographs that he took where he was using natural light. This one's sort of like that, even though it's under a tent, but he's using light that's filtered through the fabric of the tent. Here are a couple examples of uh, other interior views that he did. The antlers located on Ra Racket Lake, um, which had, they were built in 1887 by Charles Bennett. Uh, operated as a hotel until 1915. Uh, and on the right is an interior photograph of a tent at the Hotel Ampersand on Ser Saranac Lake. In the background there, you'll see a guy snoozing behind his dog. But here he's using light that's coming in through the windows. Um, the more sensitive film that's available on those glass plate negatives that I mentioned to capture these images. Here are a couple more, um, the parlor at Hotel Ampersand. And then a great photograph that shows uh, the pavilion at the Adirondack Sanitarium, where the, the game room, great fireplace. And then a couple of photographs at Hotel Champlain, the dining room, 
with the uh, the service all lined up by their tables. And finishing with the sun parlor at Childwald. This is a rather unusual photograph. There perhaps there are more out there, but it's the only one that we have of this type. Here, he's actually photographing a football game um, between Cornell and Rochester in 1889. Um, and it, it's, um, I think, notable because it, it's actually almost a, an action photograph. Um, he hasn't had these people all pose for the photograph. Some of them are actually in mid stride. It's rather amazing that the, the film has, uh, where the glass plate emulsion is um, sensitive enough that he can be taking much shorter exposures than he would have been able to do in earlier times. Around this time also started, Stoddard uh, began traveling around the world actually and taking photographs and um, using them to become a lecturer. So the purpose of his photography is changing. He's not selling prints as much to the public as he's making his living through speaker's fees. Um, and uh, unfortunately, I think a lot of this travel photography uh, hasn't survived because it wasn't um, Adirondack focused, but uh, it is an important part of what he did in his later career. One trip he made was to Alaska in 1892. A couple of the images you see here. He also purchased photographs on his travels. So everything that we find in our collection is actually not his photography. I mentioned also how he had to change what he was doing. Um, he was looking for sort of those pictures that captured an area. Um, the one on the left is entitled Milking Time. Uh, on the right, it's Vermont haymakers. Uh, they're not just the images that you'd find uh, in the Adirondacks, which we often uh, associate with him. He was traveling to other places. He went up the Atlantic coast. He went to Florida. He went to the Southwest, uh, traveled overseas. Here's another one that's uh, an Adirondack scene. That's really what he's uh, looking to capture here. It's uh, a rustic campsite. So he's actually, um, I refer to it as, uh, he's looking for these images uh, to actually tell a story. I call them narrative photographs. They're not actually capturing a particular place or a particular person that's identified in the photograph. Um, these are intended to be attractive to anybody. Oh, they're going to say, oh, isn't that cute? Let's get that photograph. Um, the one on the left is actually, we believe, taken in the New York City area of fishermen. Uh, the duck hunters on the right is um, up north of here along the Richelieu River. These are more of the narrative photographs uh, that I'm talking about. Um, the one on the left, a bargain. He's definitely using this photograph to tell a story. It's not just doesn't have sort of point blank um, subject matter. There's something more going on. On the right, he actually entitled it Mus Music Hath Charms. Again, this is at the uh, American Canoe Association meet on Long Island. They have uh, brought in some entertainers to um, provide evening entertainment. Um, you'll find in many of the photographs, there seems to be an ethnographic interest in some of them. It's capturing local flavor or um, a different life that people are going to find fascinating. And that's the appeal of the photographs. Did a whole series of these fishermen on the Richelieu River, um, which suggests that each one has a title. It's sort of a different part of that narrative of the story. Uh, lifting the net on the left, a good catch on the right. Uh, and what I found fascinating, there's one photograph in the group um, where 
you don't really need to see the detail of what's happening. Uh oh, where'd it go? Oh, I'll get to it in a moment. I'm sorry, I jumped, I jumped the gun. Uh, here's another narrative one, who wouldn't be a boy? Um, here it is. I got my images out of sequence. You can't really see what's happening in this photograph. It's entirely backlit. The characters are just shadows. Um, but he gave it a title there, Fishers Went Out Sailing Into the West. It's almost poetic. Again, the, the sky that you see is, is burned in. It was a backlit photograph to start with, but he's added the sky that you see. I'm gonna end with this photograph, which is of course my all time favorite. Um, and this is Avalanche Lake from the North. I think it really captures a lot of um, what he had achieved as a photographer dated 1888. Um, what I detailed for you on the right is if you look way down in the lower third center of the photograph of the lake, you'll see this tiny figure. And he's included that to provide some scale to the photograph, to draw your eye into it. You'll notice that it's actually framed against the, the highlight of the reflected sky and the water. But the photograph is full of detail. It's, it's very detailed. And he's actually worked in a burned in sky as well to give it some added drama.